four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging projects. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us and talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening through to us through your radio on one of the 16 radio stations that are broadcasting our program here in 2020, a radio app, a the website, our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, underneath the season four tab at the top of the page, podcast replay or in studio video replay. Thank you very much. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees. Make your yard look better indoors and out, plus preserving what you grow. It's all about you, and we're here to help you achieve those goals. There are several ways in which you can contact us before, during, and after the program here. You can get a hold of us anytime on email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you're on Twitter, you can send us a tweet at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG, and we will tweet you back. You can also find us on our Facebook page, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or you can jam your fingers in the phone anytime, day or night, 24-7. Give us a call with your question that we can answer for you at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Well, we have a big show lined up for you, as we do every program we want to bring you the best and most informational packed program that you possibly can listen to we're going to be talking about vegetables that you can grow in partial shade in segment one and in segment two things to know before you go to your local independent garden center and buy plant starts good conversation we're going to have there and our guest this week author matt mattis plus answering all the garden questions we can jam into the program so let's get started with our first uh, segment here. We're going to talk about partial shade plants or vegetables that you can grow. Now, first of all, Holly, what is the definition of partial shade? Partial shade is basically if you have less than eight hours of full sun. So you might have something behind a garage or a shed. Uh, maybe a tree covers the sun in the afternoon. It means It doesn't mean like you get two hours of sun or something a day or no 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 sun. It means that you just have less sun. Uh, full sun is all day long, 8, 12 hours, however long the sun can uh, shade, uh, shine on the location. Partial shade is about, you know, three to six hours, preferably higher on that spectrum than lower. Though we'll talk about different vegetables that do tolerate that lower spectrum of that three to four hours rather than the uh, six hours available. Now, Holly, you have a saying about a good guideline to follow what works best and where and how. Right. So the saying is that if you grow it for the root or the fruit, you need full sun. So that would include like tomatoes, peppers, squash, any root crop, then you need the full sun. But if you don't grow it for the root or fruit, you can have the partial shade. And that's a good thing to keep in mind when it comes to should I or should I not plant this particular vegetable in this particular location? Now, we've got a number of these plants that we're going to talk about, and we're not going to go through all of them. There's 30 on our list, but we're going to go through some of the more common ones that you may be wondering, can I plant or can I not plant in partial shade? Now, first one I want to talk about is asparagus. Number one, asparagus is a perennial, meaning it will come back year and year and year after year, 20 to 50 years in some uh, realms, if you have a partial shade area that doesn't or is not really good for anything else and you want something to stay there permanently, asparagus would be 
the choice to grow in that particular location. Right. So asparagus, like you said, it's going to grow there for many years. And it doesn't take much maintenance. Sometimes you might have to fertilize it or something, but it is a pretty low-maintenance vegetable. And homegrown asparagus is delicious. And whenever you look at partial shade areas, Early on in the growing season, yeah, everything is full sun because there's no no leaves on the trees. Uh, the light, the sun is coming up in a different spot as it would uh, than it would be in 30, 60, 90 days from the current time you're out in the yard. So you want to be aware of how things look now, how things will look in July, August, September, and keep that in calculations on what's going to be best. Now, again, asparagus, permanent spot there for a long time. Another, and, and with all of these, with all these, it's not a, another guideline in addition to your saying, Holly, they're not going to grow to magnitude that they would in full sun. Um, if, if you're, if you're growing these, they're going to be slightly smaller than if they would, than they would be if they were in full sun. So, Keep that in mind. Another one that maybe a beets is another one that, that we like to grow, and we have found success to grow them in partial shade, yes, as well as full sun. Mm-hmm. We, but the biggest thing I think with beets is that you want to grow it in um, in very loose soil, and we grow ours. Well, now we'll be growing them in a raised bed, but we grew it in a huge. Um, Grow bag. How big is that grow bag? 60 gallons. 60 gallons. So it's three feet across, and we put nice, loose, loamy soil in there, and it allowed us to grow some nice beets. Uh, Another one that works well in a grow bag raised bed is carrots. Uh, Carrots work very well in partial shade as well as full sun. Um, Another another one that we have had success with very well, and you can find it uh, if you just search the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in the search bar, is celery. Celery is it does very well in partial shade conditions. Um, cabbage is another one. Uh, one uh, t- uh, one thing here, two things here that we cannot grow, so we can't verify cannot verify if they do well in partial shade is broccoli and cauliflower. Uh, we have never had success in growing them, but it's going to be less less to less of a chance to bolt faster if you grow in the partial shade. Um, broccoli and cauliflower like the little bit of the cooler weather. So if you have it in partial shade, there it's going to to grow a little bit better and longer. Right. Uh, a couple of years, well, I guess it was five or six years ago, we had beautiful plants, uh, which I thought was Brussels sprouts. And then we planted them, and they began to form heads, and the heads were no bigger than half dollar. And that was the last time we attempted to, we had, we had a seed mix up, and then we planted broccoli that we thought was Brussels sprouts and didn't help it, didn't matter, didn't work very well at all. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, we've seen it successfully grown. We've just never done it ourselves uh, in that instance. Now, here's another one that is actually a perennial is is horseradish. Yes. And that is something that you can grow. It's a little, it can be a little bit invasive. Not really, um, but it, you do have to, it's going to keep coming back year after year. If you <laughs> if you do grow it, you don't have to grow a lot because horseradish from the ground is pretty strong, very um, potent. So, but definitely something you can you can try. Interesting fact about horseradish: you get that intensity, that pepperness flavor, whenever you shred it. It gets oxidized, and, and that's when the aroma or the intensity happens. You can eat a uh, horseradish like a carrot, and you won't get that what we're familiar with that intensity flavor if you just eat it like a carrot but if you shred it that's when that uh, peppery uh, taste comes to be another one is kohlrabi which you can start indoors you can buy from your garden center or uh, in starts or from seed we grow the green kind there is a burgundy variety but we've we've chosen to stick with the green explain holly to those who are not familiar with kohlrabi it's a very unique and uncharacteristical, uncharacteristic type of vegetable. Sure. So kohlrabi is of the brassica or the coal family. It To me, it tastes like a radish almost, but it doesn't look like a radish. It looks like it grows in the ground, but it does not grow in the ground. It grows above ground. It looks like a root crop. When you pull it, when you harvest it, it looks like a root crop, but it just does not. It does have like a bulb with some leaves on top. But it grows above the ground. If you've never seen it, do a do a search online. You will be very uh, intrigued by the very, look of it. It's very popular in a lot of like German dishes. Yeah. You can pickle it as well. 
Uh, kale at the, at the leafy green. Leaf lettuce is a very easy one to grow. Um, now, with leaf lettuce, it grows well. Romaine grows well, too, in partial shade. Now, there's a green romaine and a red romaine in which you can choose to get the starts from or you can start them by yourself. We have done both, and we have found that the red romaine lettuce tends to not bolt as quickly as the green does. You get a few, about a week or two longer before the bolting occurs, before it gets bitter. And when the leaves and, the, and it gets bitter, what is occurring there, it's in that central stalk of the leaf. You'll see that, that main stem when you pluck a leaf off. Just remove that stem and then eat the leaf its, leaves itself. You can eat lettuce all summer long as long as you take a little more effort to remove that center stalk, that uh, center vein in that leaf that contains the bitterness. Right. Um, so we also have parsnip and okay. So then we have mustard greens and mizuno. Those are both those are both greens. Uh, garlic can be grown in partial shade. Mm-hmm. Again, not as large as it would be in full sun. Um, and then parsnip. That's if you've never had a parsnip. It's a root crop. To me, it tastes like a more earthy carrot. Um, it's a distinct. It's a very distinct taste. Yes. Peas uh, nice. can be grown early in the spring, late in the fall. Uh, partial shade, very easily. Potatoes. Potatoes can be grown in partial shade, um, as well as radishes. And your not favorite rhubarb can be grown in partial shade. Right. So, uh, <laughs> spinach and and Swiss chard. Swiss chard. Uh, we talked about it last week on the program. Swiss chard is a Spinach substitute that does not go to bolt unless conditions are very unfavorable. It will go to bolt, the, the, go to seed the second year. But Swiss chard is a very good uh, plant to grow. And you don't need a lot of Swiss chard to get a lot of Swiss chard leaves. Right. And then we also have turnip. Um, Turnips and rutabagas. However, we don't have success growing those in the spring. We... The days get too long and it gets too warm and they go to bolt. We have found turnips take 60 days to reach maturity. Uh, rutabagas take 90 days. We find uh, in zone five here in southeast Wisconsin, if we grow them about the early to mid portions of August, we get very, very nice turnips and rutabagas. By the time the day lengths get shorter and the temperatures get colder and we get some frost on them because it makes them sweeter. And it works very well. And a lot of these plants, if you allow a frost to occur on them late in the season, they will become sweeter as the sugars release in the plant. So that's just a number of different plants in which you can grow in partial shade. Now, notice we left out because it's not doesn't qualify the peppers, the tomatoes, the eggplants, the cucumbers. Now, if you have an area in your backyard where you are limited on the amount of sunlight you get, then you can grow, if you really desperately want to grow tomatoes, grow a cherry variety in the sunniest spot you possibly can find. Cherry varieties tend to develop better than a full tomato in partial shade because the duration from flower to fruit harvest is about 10 to 12 days shorter. So you can keep that in mind if you're really wanting to grow tomatoes in partial shade. Also, you can use grow bags from rootmaker.com. Uh, use coupon code TWVG and uh, get 10% off your entire order. And you can move or put these things wherever you want in your front yard, backyard, side yard, wherever that uh, the sunlight is at. Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our seventh show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talk about seven perennial flowers you may want to put in your landscape and eight heat fruit spinach substitutes. Our guest was author How to Grow Straw Bills, Joel Karsten. He's a straw bill gardening expert. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we will make it even easier for you to find them. You can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com and then just put in the subject line, Show six, and we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about what to know before buying your plants from the Garden Center. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden and more. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. 
We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jims will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat, it can't be beat. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you with 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap. Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IvyOrganics.com. Responsible watering, accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it. Tomatosnaps.com. Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, grass. Travels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts. Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about things that you should know before you go to your local independent garden center and purchase plants. Yeah, you would think you'd just go in, grab a plant, walk out, and everything's hunky-dory. Well, there is some things that you might want to be aware of before doing such that. Now, we reference independent garden center centers because that is the bread and butter of what we do. Without them, the big box stores take over, and 
the big box stores, here's the problem with the big box stores, Holly. They, I want to explain the big oh, problem. Oh, oh, okay. You explain it then. Okay. So when you go to a big box store, um, you might have Jim who works in paint. Jim knows nothing. Jim knows nothing. Jim's like, well, paint, you know, paint sales are down, so they stick me in the garden center during the growing season, so I can tell you where to Does get the... Does this one change to red? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. What, what, okay, yeah. yeah. This is, I can tell you where to get the petunias, mm-hmm. but that's about it. Like, you know, Jim, Jim just wants to go back to mixing paint. He's just filling in whatever. Jim's so, thinking about his girlfriend tomorrow night. That, he doesn't care. Right. Yeah. So, that's, and, that's and, a problem. And they focus on Three weeks a year. That's it. That's all they well, really care. I think it's a little bit more than that. But, but, but the definitely, rec- it's, but like the, yeah. up, it's like basically they focus anywhere from between in the United States between Mother's Day and Memorial Day, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, they, they, it's just something to get people in the store to buy other things. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. So, or, you, or you're in the store and you're like, oh, they have a garden center. Maybe I'll pick up some XYZ. So independent and they garden also, centers. They also, <laughs> big box stores don't have a huge, a huge selection of of edible plants. Right. Either. Independent garden centers, this is what they do. This is how they make their money. This is how they get... Now, obviously, they have, like, landscaping and they have lawn care and they snow removal in the winter and and that type of thing. But they understand because this is the life in which they live. This is their their thing. Uh, farmers do farming. They know farming. Independent garden centers do gardening, and that's what they do, and that's what they're and good at. you'll notice when you go in, the, you know, the people are passionate they will talk to you. They'll answer your questions. They so. will come up to you. Yeah. They won't run from you. <laughs> can I much. help you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is not every plant they sell can be planted outside in your area. Well, for, first of all, we're going to reference our independent garden center that, that sponsors our show here on the Milwaukee market. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other other markets across the country, you you don't have a Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. If you did, you would be very fortunate uh, but that is the the official garden center uh, for those who are listening on the Milwaukee stations everywhere else. Uh, we're, when you hear that, that's what we're referencing. But yeah, go ahead with not not every plant that is sold at, at a garden center can be grown can be grown in in your zone. So just because you see a lime tree or a citrus tree, well, it must be. I, yeah, I, yeah, I can plant this outside. No, I do a little research and until fall when it dies. Yeah, so definitely. Um, you could talk with, you know, a person there and say, this is a cool plant. How do I grow it? Or how do I plant it? Or where do I plant it? Whatever. We had a dwarf lime tree that we had growing for many years. Unfortunately, um, you know, it got, it got attacked by scale. But, yeah, we we are definitely probably going to hopefully replace it, I think, um, at some point. But, yeah, so we had, but then we kept it inside year-round, and it did really well. We got a lot of limes. Um so yeah, that's something that you want to keep in mind. Also, if it doesn't look healthy, you can't you you doesn't mean you can make it healthy or not captain save a plant. <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure that you are taking healthy plants home. If it's got, you know, just choose another one. I we had Joe Lampa on a couple of weeks ago and he was like you can even look at the roots, you yeah, know. Pull them out of the container. And see and see what what it's going what's got it's because going on. when you do that in at an independent garden center, there's going to be other shoppers that are going to look at you strange. But the people who work there, they know what you're looking at. You're looking for healthy, clean, white, non-root-bound roots. And mm-hmm. if that plant has very heavily dark-colored, root-bound, uh, root-bound roots, that plant is not healthy. It's been severely stressed, and that's not the plant for you to bring home and try to save. It doesn't work that way. Uh, again, we, we've talked about why we recommend independent garden centers uh, versus the big box stores because of that knowledgeable staff in which they have. And here's the thing. If you go to an independent garden center and, and Sarah has just started working there, Sarah may not know the answer to your question, but Sarah knows to get a hold of Beverly. And if Beverly doesn't know, she knows to get a hold of Roger. Somebody's got an answer for you. Mm-hmm, definitely. And, I mean, I've even seen people at Blue Mill say, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but... We have so and so that can get us an answer. We'll give you a call. Right. Yeah. They have sources, just like mm-hmm. we have sources, just like farmers have sources, just like teachers have sources. And it, they might have to contact, you know, somebody from bulk material who grows that particular plant or something. But they they want to provide you their answer because they want you to go there. They want you to come back. They want you to have success. Jim in the paint aisle at the big box store doesn't care what happens to no. your plants. 
once you leave. Now, just because you, you have an answer or you have a question and you Google it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the right answer. So don't be afraid to ask those hard questions because Google or Bing or Yahoo or whatever search engine you choose to to go through, they'll provide an answer. It's not necessarily the right answer. It'll throw something up on the screen, mm-hmm. but it may not be the correct uh, information which you're trying to gather. I think another thing is that you want to... Um, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead yep. here, but you want to know what you're going to, where you're going to plant these items before you buy it. So you can't just walk into a garden center and be like, I'm going to grow some plants. And you need to know where you're going to put them. You want to know how much space you have, your sun availability, things like that. So if you go in, you're like, I'm going to grow all the tomatoes, but you're growing in a, a a one foot area and you have no sunlight. You gotta be reasonable. You gotta be reasonable. So the biggest thing is also you need to do a little bit of your, your research. Yep. Have a plan. Well. Yeah, have a plan. And, and especially more this year than ever before because a lot of these independent garden centers will only allow so many people when they do open up to get in and get out and they don't want you to mingle around and talk with it. You're going in, you're getting your product and you're getting out of there. Uh, because they have worked the deal in order should, to get you in and get you out. That should be your plan pretty much anywhere you yeah. shop right now. But, yes, for uh, sure. Don't buy a vegetable that is in full bloom because, you th- because number one, is 98% or, off, and you think, oh, it's ready to put tomatoes on. It's not going to do anything for you but get stressed because you moved it out of the container, threw it in the ground, and it's already stressed. A plant that is in bloom is a stressed plant. So just because it's a nickel – doesn't mean you should take it home and try to fix that plant because it's too far gone. It ain't going to happen. That's being Captain Save a Plant. I know, but we're but just reiterating. But the same thing with strawberries, right? Like you'll see this cute, oh, this cute little hanging strawberry planter. It's so cute. But you need to understand that strawberries are not, they're perennials. They're going to come back here after. And most time they're dead by the 4th of July. Right. So, yeah, it's cute for a minute and then it's not. So keep that in mind. Anything that has that you want to try to continue to grow and take care of get your mind away from like that that point of it's called point of sale where they get you excited about it from the point of sale as opposed to an actual um like an actual purchase for you and you see this more actually the point of sale like a big box store but definitely keep in mind that yes it looks cute but it might not be practical. Now j- don't be alarmed if you go to your independent garden center and you may see a, a bug or a moth or something flying around. That actually is a good thing. Now, if, if the, you walk into a greenhouse and the, 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 the ceiling is covered and the plants are overwhelmed with insects of aphids and moths and all that, a few is okay. That indicates that they're not using a harmful, harsh chemicals and coating the plants every day with this chemical to kill and, and sterilize the entire uh, property that they're on. So that's a good thing if you see a few. Now, if you start, if you if you walk in, you grab a uh, broccoli plant, start a, a tray of them, and you see it's infants. If it's loaded with aphids, then go ahead and get a hold of a staff member, uh, an employee, and say, "Hey, you got a problem here. You might want to address before it overwhelms the whole greenhouse per day uh, per se." Right. Um, that's definitely another thing. And then pay attention to the quality of the employees. Um, it says a lot about the, the place and the management. If you go into a garden center or a greenhouse, nursery, whatever, and they got, you know, uh, Jim Bob who's got spaghetti sauce all over his shirt and the manager. Or off know, in the corner smoking oh, somewhere. Yeah. Or smoking yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Or something. Or they just look like they, they don't, don't want to be there. Yeah. yeah. Like they don't want to be there. That's a reflection on management. That's a reflection on a lot of things. Um, yeah, you definitely need to pay attention to that. I worked for a plant distributor that just distributed plants to a big box store. And you could tell, you know, who I worked for because we had our shirts and it said that. And then you could also, you could tell when other people were stocking plants that worked for a different distributor, maybe they didn't look as professional. And the lack of care was a little less. Yeah. Well, and we'll, we'll reference Blue Mouse. When you go to Blue Mouse Landscape and Garden Center, they come to you. The staff does. They welcome you. They're excited to see you, and they're willing to help you. And that should be any garden, independent garden center across the country. They should be welcoming you because without you, they don't exist. Uh, one last thing. If you purchase something, 
and it begins to not go well. If the plant begins to see, show issues after you've planted it, and you know it's not something that you have done, not, it's good to contact the garden center and say, hey, I purchased this tree, this shrub, this bush, this berry plant, whatever, and two days later, this is what occurred. Um, you, it, They will appreciate you letting them know what's going on because it may be a reflection of there was a a different formula that was incorporated into their fertilizing system, and now it has shown up days later. So it's good to, to do that and let them people know what's going on. So just don't go to your independent garden center and just grab a, a plant and walk out and have a plan, know what to do, know what to ask, and uh, appreciate what they do because they are whom make uh, the the world goes around in the gardening gardening world. Right. So speaking of spring, soon it will be warming up, and you want to make sure you can enjoy your, your yard without sharing it with the beetles and grubs. With spring just around the corner, almost here, it's time to start thinking about controlling beetles and grubs in your garden and your yard. Grub gone can be applied to turf or garden or around ornamental to ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact of the beetles they have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, easy to apply with a commercial spreader or irrigate into the soil. Biologically, that specific, it specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming beneficials such as bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. And to be honest, it's the only non-chemical that works. Go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. Go any, go, we will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We're talking with Matt Mattis. He's an author. You're listening to Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make the grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. World's coolest rain gauge.com. Need I say more? The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and and get 10% off your entire order. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Dreaming of a lush green lawn and abundant garden? Not sure what products you need? Check with Chapin. From sprayers to spreaders to fertilizer injectors and greener gardening options, Chapin offers the products you need to weed and feed your lawn and garden. Feed your plants every time you water with Chapin's HydroFeed Fertilizer Injector. Weed a greener way with Chapin's Horticultural Vinegar Sprayer. Check with Chapin. Visit www.chapinmfg.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts. Spartan Mosquito. Dr. Jim's. Nasala Kabucha. MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, 
Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Well, spring is here. Planting season is just, if it's not here, it, it will be here in a matter of days. And Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center has all the products you need. From bulk material, we've gotten yards of compost delivered to our garden this week, as well as they'll have their nursery greenhouse open early May. There's regulations and rules that you need to follow on that. But Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center is the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Been that way for a number of years, and they've got a knowledgeable staff that will help you with all your questions. You can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just off of Layton. Give them a call at 414-282-4220 and check out their website at bluemails.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around. Holly, let's go to Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our next guest. Matt Mattis is a gardener, blogger, and author with a lifelong passion for horticulture. And he is located in the uh, the Boston, Massachusetts area. Welcome to the program, Matt. Hi, Holly. How are you? I was going to make you try and say the town I live in because no one can ever say it right. <laughs> Isn't it like Worcester or something? It's Worcester. Well, Worcester. here they say Worcester. Okay. Well, right, but it's Worcester, like Worcestershire. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your, your schedule to join Holly and myself and, and all of our listeners across the country and all of our radio stations that carry our, our program, and we, we thank you for that. No problem. Thanks for having me. We, we want to start with how did, where did the love of gardening come from for you? Everybody has a, a certain unique story. What, what's yours? Well, mine is, it just goes back to when I was very young. My parents were gardeners. Um, and my parents were older when I was born. I was clearly the accident, you know. So they were Depression era parents. My dad was born in 1914. So they, uh, it was my grandfather's house, and my father was raised in this house. And they have a huge, you know, maybe a half acre vegetable garden. So, you know, we kids, like a lot of kids in, let's say, in the 1960s, were, uh, were basically labor <laughs> for them in the garden. And I think out of all the kids, I was the one that really started to enjoy it. They gave me a little piece of garden to grow some vegetables in, and that's how it started. Now, it it wasn't that, hey, do you want to help? It was you're going to help kind of situation? It was exactly that. <laughs> and, and then and then was it, hey, thanks for helping? And then you're like, what, what did I have a choice here? What, what happened here? <laughs> right, no, it was like, yeah, you helped... Uh, you helped uh, grow it, and now you're going to help eat it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed very natural, though. And, you know, it was magical because I remember we didn't have a greenhouse, but we had a glassed-in front porch, and we would start seeds early, and I was the youngest. So to me, that was all sort of magical science project work. And, and like for many of us, we knew no different. That was life. It wasn't that we were hearing from other people, hey, you're, you're working too hard. That, that was life to survive. It was, and I live in a very ethnic neighborhood in the East Coast. You get a lot of, you know, the Italian neighborhood and the Portuguese neighborhood, and this was a Swedish and Lithuanian Polish neighborhood. And so everyone I grew up with had big vegetable gardens. So when it was tomato processing season, you know, we were on the cellars with our grandparents canning tomatoes and peeling them and scalding our hands. Well, that's really neat. Um, in your new, in your new book, Master Mastering the Art of Flower Gardening, what is one of the biggest mistakes a new flower gardener makes, or even just perhaps a seasoned flower gardener? Um, I think, well, today, you know, it's different than it was 40, 50 years ago. There are a lot of garden centers, a lot of big box stores carry plants. And I think, I think a lot of new people do this. You go to the garden center and you're like, I want to start a flower garden. And you just buy everything you want on that one visit, on that one day, you know, especially with perennials. And uh, what you end up with is a garden that looks really awesome in early June and then doesn't look like much unless you bought some grasses for the rest of the summer. And I think a lot of us, you know, fall into that trap. It's pretty. Uh, I'm buying it now. I'll throw it in the ground. But I really don't know what I should. I, I don't know what I should know in order to get this thing to do what it needs to do. 
Right, and we've sort of trained retail to function that way. So, you know, everything has to be in bloom and everything has to fit on the shelf and it looks beautiful, um, but not everything lasts the whole season. So, you know, I think the best way to avoid that is to visit garden centers or local nurseries every few weeks throughout the summer right into fall. And that's what we talked about in the previous segment about going to your independent garden center because they care and they know and they have answers for your questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. They know. Now, in your new book, Mastering the Art of Vegetable Gardening, you cover a lot of common vegetables that many gardeners grow. And it's a very good book, a very basic book. But for many gardeners, they need a very basic book in order to start off. Uh, what would you say is the most foolproof uh, vegetable that somebody can grow? I think for foolproof, I'm not going to say tomatoes because, you know, there are a lot of problems you can have with tomatoes, although I think everyone who has the vegetable garden probably has tomatoes. And uh, But I would think the most foolproof is start with what, you know, a, a child might grow, like beans, uh, string beans, pole beans, you know, pretty much can handle almost any type of conditions as long as you're watering and giving them the basic needs. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's a big seed, right? And it's easy to plant. Uh, and, uh, and they taste delicious. So I think that's pretty foolproof. What, if there is a what foolproof. would, yeah, what would you say is one of the more challenging ones in, in your opinion from your experience? Um, well, I, I always look for the most challenging thing to okay. grow, it seems. So that was artichokes for me. Um, but there are new artichoke varieties that you can grow as an annual because it's a biennial. Um, but I, you know, I was looking at your your uh, uh, video. I think it's on YouTube. It was on your website. Um, and I was going to mention onions because you think onions are really simple. And I, I know I grew up in a world where you planted onion sets. But let's face it, you never get good onions from onion sets. Exactly. I mean, they're great for growing onion greens, right? So I think, you know, if you, uh, you know, if people with raised beds could go out there and you can pick all your onion sets that you're growing and they're gone in a month and a half anyway. So that's fine. But, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you talk about this in, on your site. You said, uh, you know, growing onions from seed. So absolutely, onions from seed, um, that's something I really discovered was it, it really changed how you grow onions. So now I can get softball-sized onions if I get starts or if I get seeds, if I start my seeds in January here in New England. Well, and, and um, I think a lot of people have failures because they don't understand long-day, short-day, and mid-day or neutral-day varieties. They just grab whatever they see, and, oh, it's an onion. It's got to grow, and that's not always the case. Right, or you know the varieties that you see in the supermarket, so you think I want to grow, you know, a sweet onion, you know, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you know, any of the Maui sweets or something, and those are all sh- short-day onions, and you really can't grow those in the north. And and, my, and I found my brother growing Walla Walla sweets, and, I, and he could never get them to grow big, and that's why. So, yeah, that's you know, there's a little learning curve there, but I think any good seed catalog, right, will basically will call that out. Yeah, exactly. But, and the other thing with onions is high in nitrogen. I mean, if you look at the commercial onion grower sites and the FDA sites, it's – it's a ridiculous amount of nitrogen, which, you know, most of us don't want to put. But we, we started using horse manure from a neighboring farm, and that made all the difference in the world. Just that little bit, uh, that yeah. little thing. I think you kind of almost answered this, but was there a commonly grown vegetable you have had trouble growing? You'd say maybe artichokes. But yeah. after a while, maybe, you know, you, you learned how to grow at different techniques. What was it? What helped you? And why did you keep trying? Well, it was actually it was parsley, which is kind of funny because you know it's such a common thing, right? Most of us thought of it as just a garnish. But if you cook, right, you're going to make tabbouleh. You need six cups of parsley. So we're big cooks here, so we grow two ten foot rows of parsley. And and recently, I started noticing parsley blooming in the garden. You know, I'd buy it at the garden center because it wasn't something I was going to bother with. And I, I was wondering why is it blooming? You know, and you cut the flower stems off, and it's really gone because it's a biennial. And what I discovered in researching my book was that parsley is in the carrot family, right, APACA, and all those plants don't like to be transplanted. And nurseries now are are carrying larger plants of parsley because I think people like buying a larger plant. But young seedlings transplant easily. Um, If you get one more than with four pairs of leaves, and it's exposed to cold weather below 50 degrees for a week or two, it's going to bolt when it gets warm again because it thinks it made it through a winter. So I, that was a big aha for me, to so start 
not just that, but variety, because you can grow really delicious varieties of parsley that are not the commercial varieties if you buy seeds from seed catalogs. That, that's very interesting that the larger the plant, bigger the shock, the, the more it would uh, decide in order to go to seed because of that transplant or that, that uh, environment that it's in. You, right. The smaller the, the start, the better off that you are. The smaller the start is better. I mean, and why pay six ninety five for, you know, a one-quart pot of parsley <laughs> unless you're going to pick it that day and that's it. Exactly. Well, Matt, where can we find more about you? Where can we pick up your books? That, two great books, by the way, uh, for, for any gardener to put on their shelf to give to a new gardener. This is the year of new gardeners. Uh, where, where can we go to get these books at? Uh, thanks, Joey. It is on Amazon and basically everywhere online that sells books. Um, and some local bookstores have it. You can ask them to order it. But it's basically available everywhere. It's Mastering the Art of Vegetable Gardening. And then I have a blog, growingwithplants.com. Well, Matt, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day and enlightening us about the, the smaller the plant start versus buying a big one, uh, the, the problems that you found and the uh, the reasons why it was happening. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Holly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's all going to be about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Ship Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Ship Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to shipdrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit proplugger.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Hello, gardeners. It's Anne from Neptune's Harvest Organic Fertilizers in Gloucester, Mass. If you're planting flowers, vegetables, shrubs, or just trying to keep your lawn healthy and green, then you should know about Neptune's Harvest. Neptune's Harvest fertilizers come from the mineral-rich North Atlantic Ocean, which contains all the nutrients plants and soil need. Flower growers, get your sunglasses out. You'll want to use them when you're looking at how bright those colors are. Vegetable growers, with Neptune's Harvest, you can achieve the amazing results you deserve for all your efforts. You'll have the most abundant, sweet-tasting supply of organically grown produce. And there's nothing like the taste of a fresh garden tomato you grew yourself. Neptune's Harvest works so great, whether you know what you're doing or not, you'll look good and you'll feel good because you're doing the right thing for the environment and your health. Try Neptune's Harvest products from the ocean to set your plants in motion. Available at your local garden center and to learn more, go to NeptunesHarvest.com. Stay tuned and you can win a gallon of Neptune's Harvest Liquid Fertilizer, a $50 value, following the commercial break. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Dot com is your destination for all things gardening. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, 1600 Garden Videos, Radio Shows, Podcast and In-Studio Videos, plus our in-garden videos. We're building raised beds. You can check that out. Just search raised beds there as well. During the break, you heard 
that you can win. And Holly, um, from Neptune, Neptune's Harvest, Holly, what are the rules and regulations in order to be entered into this giveaway? Open to listeners 18 years old and older living in the contiguous United States. This giveaway ends Thursday, April 23rd at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. Winner will be notified via email on Thursday, April 23rd, and we will have, they will have seven days to reply to claim their prize. For details, go to WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the giveaway tab at the top of the page. So here's the details, um, what you would receive. There's one winner every week. Yep. Um, and every winner receives all of this. One, one gallon of fish and seaweed blend. That's a two, three, one blend. One four pound bag of crab and lobster shell blend. That's a five, three, oh blend. One four ounce of the best yet biting insect spray. And also a t-shirt, a hat, two, two, uh, can koozies and two stickers shipped directly to you. It's a $150 value. So here's what you got to do in order to get entered into the giveaway. No purchase necessary. Uh, you'll send an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. In the subject line, you will put enter me. And in the uh, co- uh, contacts box, you'll answer this question. The question is, is a green pepper technically a ripe pepper? True or false? We would need your, uh, just your name, the general area in which you're from, and if you're the winner, we'll reach back out to you and get more details on how to get the product shipped to you. If you've got a question, you can submit it uh, via email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can certainly send us a uh, phone call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW anytime, and we will get your question answered. Holly, what do we got for the question? What is the material or filler that is used in NPK fertilizer, so as opposed to just the NPK components? Right, the, the minerals. Uh, basic uh, they're basically, it's sand and granular limestone are the most popular fillers uh, because they are inexpensive and they make distributing the fertilizer easier without adding uh, more cost to the, the packaging. So, yeah, it's okay to, to go ahead and use any type of granular fertilizer. That's what the other additional materials are. Uh, some add micro and macro nutrients as well. So Kathleen from British Columbia says, I work at a, a roaster and... I'm planning to grow in the burlap sacks this year, as you show one of your videos. I'm wondering if you had any trouble with pests eating the bags. I'm also curious if bags held up for the whole season. Fantastic video, super inspiring. Well, we did not have any issues with the pests for the for two main reasons. One, we kept the soil moist, so no mice or anything, rats. Um, and two, we kept the grass cut around the bags, so less chance of bugs building or living a home, having a home there. Um, and yeah, they did, they did last throughout the season. By the time the season was over, the, the bottom of the bags was, uh, biodegraded, but we doubled up on the bags as well just to offer a little bit more support. Because some of them are not woven very tightly. Yeah, some of them are kind of porous. So yeah, that's what we did. And it was really fun. And I thought it made a cute little garden. We put our garden home back there and, um, it was fun. Okay. Holly, here's a question for you. What is the difference between bone meal and blood meal? Thank you. <laughs> blood meal is dried and powdered animal blood, so it increases soil nitrogen levels. Bone meal is ground animal bones and increases the calcium and the phosphorus. This is a byproduct of the butchering industry. If you're a vegan or you feel that those are in, uh, ingredients in which you do not want to include into your garden, there are other means in which to achieve those mineral supplements, so keep that in mind. Uh, okay, Holly, next question here. I initially, I, I have a problem figuring out how much water I should water my newly germinated baby lettuce. Any input? So, yeah, you want to keep the soil safe. Um, it's safe to keep the soil damp like a sponge. If you poke your finger in the soil and it feels damp, you are good. If it has not come up, you can cover the soil with a sheet of paper towel to hold the moisture. And we had to do that with our lettuce that were growing in the win- win- uh, window window yeah so um so another question is do blackberries need acidic soil no they do not now you can grow blackberries in a very large container like a half of a whiskey barrel that type of situation uh because they if you do not have an area in which you can allow them to grow naturally they will they will be kind of invasive they'll take over an area uh so a very large container can produce a very uh bountiful harvest um the other side of the coin is if you do want to grow blueberries, and not asked in this question, but I want to reference them, 
they do require a low acidity of four to five in that range. And it has to be something that's maintained. Maintained. It just can't be. It's good now because if you just don't maintain it or you just put it in regular garden soil, that plant will die. Um, so unless you have naturally acidic soil or you're able to control the acidity of that soil in the ground or in a container, uh, raspberries and blue, blue uh, blackberries are the best option when you come to a berry uh, ideal there. Next question, I listened to you. This is Jane. She said, I listened to you at the Wisconsin Garden Expo Madison. I just downloaded your podcast. You talk about mulching your raised beds. Do you, do you, what do you use? Do you use straw? Uh, where sh- should I use straw? Where can I get it from? How do I know that it's not full of weeds? Thanks a bunch. Well, uh, we use a, a variety of different materials. We use straw, yes, and the majority of straw in which you're going to get from your local independent garden center or farm store will most likely not have weed seeds or a large quantity of them simply because the straw is the byproducts of oats, uh, wheat, uh, other uh, barley, and there's not many weeds in those areas at the time of uh, harvest and baling of the material. If you're going to your garden center... And uh, you can ask them, Is there been? Ha- have you sold a lot of the straw, and has there been any complaints about having a lot of seeds in that straw? Additionally, we've used shredded leaves, and we use shredded leaves. We have a mound of those in the garden. And chemical-free and seed-free grass clippings are also used on our raised beds and will be used to retain moisture. What fertilizer would you add, Swiss chard, once it starts growing big? Lisa has asked. I would use a um, uh, the chicken soup for the soil would be a good one uh, from Dr. Jim's, D-R-J-I-M-Z. Uh, it's a one-gallon concentrate. Uh, it makes up to 128 gallons, and it's very good to nutri- uh, nutriently fill the soil, condition the soil. So that's something that I would recommend using not only on the Swiss chard, but on all of your vegetation. Uh, Bridget wants to know, uh, no, she has a comment. Oh, she has a comment. Okay. In regards to when we were talking about growing okra, that was this um, season two, couple our weeks segment ago. two of, couple se- weeks of ago. the season, yeah. Um, she said, fried okra is so freaking good. Um, okay. Well, you, again, <laughs> Holly is not a fan of okra at all. So, ne- so uh, what's the next question, Holly? I stuck some of my store-bought garlic that grew out of hand in my raised bed a couple weeks ago. Figuring what's the worst that could happen. Same with some onions that were growing in the back of the fridge. We'll see if they produce anything by this fall. Would you have an experience with either of these scenarios? Yes, the store like garlic would grow. You may get small bulbs as it being store bought, generic variety, and doesn't have those cold hours. Garlic does need some cold hours. Um, so that's why we grow it in the fall and harvest it in spring for that winter cold hours situation. Yeah, so it's going to be I don't know, probably about what eighty percent smaller. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be small. You're, you're going to get something. It's better than just letting it sit and rot in the in the kitchen. With the onions, you will get greens and seeds. Now, onions fall into the three day grouping. So, if you have, if you live in the north, you should be planting a long day variety. If you live in the south, you want to plant a short day. If you live in the middle of the United States, you pl- you grow midday. So, if you're if you're in the north, and you got some southern on the onions, you're probably not going to get a lot of growth anyway from those onions and that were in the back of your fridge. But you can definitely, um, you know, if we grow them for the greens, they'll have some nice onion greens. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, know the variety. Uh, you're, you're just going to get greens. That's yeah. You know, I don't want to say you're wasting your time because you're going to get something out of it. Um, but be aware of what the end result will be, so you're not disappointed. Uh, Nick writes in and asks, "Can you recommend? Uh, 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 what can you recommend a yellow whole grain cornmeal?" for using to control early blight around tomatoes. I've almost completely stopped growing tomatoes because the early blight, and I've tried only, I've tried watering them early, trimming the lower leaves. They've grown eight foot tall, but they produce very little fruit, like three to five pounds per plant. Thank you. Okay, so for the whole grain cornmeal, you want to use yellow whole grain. We don't really have a brand, but all you do is you look, you go to your cornmeal baking section, whatever. You're going to see some whole grain yellow cornmeal. It's going to say it on the package. You might have to read a little bit, look at the ingredients, whatever. Um, not the, not the white. It's got to be yellow. Right. And it has to be whole grain. So you might see like the super processed stuff. This is going to be the whole grain. Um, yeah, it's got if that- it says 
if the brand is something something mill, yeah. you're probably good. It's got a the, the reason why it's got to be yellow is because that yellow contains a beneficial bacteria called Trichoderma, which fights the early blight in your soil. That's in everybody's soil. It doesn't matter. And um, I would almost say, based on his description, that he's got a abundance of nitrogen. If he's growing these massive plants and producing very little fruit, it's not. Let's not worry about the early blight right now. Let's think about what we've got nutrient so wise in the soil. Definitely, you would want to get a soil test. That's going to be the best answer for you. And there's many different options for that, and they're not too expensive. And I would definitely invest in that. Absolutely. So you know what you're starting with instead of going. Well, I think thinking isn't knowing when it comes to all the time and effort that you put into a garden. Well, we are out of time, and we certainly thank you for yours. Uh, miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can do that by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website and clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, or you can send us an email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com and ask for season uh, Show 6, and we will send that link to you. Uh, do not uh, miss next week's show when we'll be talking about one of our favorite plants to grow, growing tomatoes successfully. And we'll also talk about irrigation, not only on the tomatoes, but your garden. Our guest will be author Melissa Norris, plus uh, we'll be talking and answering all of your garden questions. Tell your garden friends that Garden Talk Radio is on the airwaves. That's how we get our message heard, as well as share our podcast and in-studio video replay. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. (laughs) 